Good morning. Good to have you with us today. It's the week of Thanksgiving. What a what a strange uh, what a strange beginning it is to this week. The pandemic is impacting all of us. It has been for so long in new ways here recently. Maybe we are not going to be with family like we normally have planned. We're not able to get together the same way. You're at home, not able to get out. If you're listening, it's possible you've not been able to get out since this started. You've known people who have been impacted by COVID. Uh, maybe you're fighting it yourself. Um, just, just the, the, there's been a real lot of challenges in our life right now. And when we think about those challenges and we think about our life and, and circumstances in our life, and then we think of Thanksgiving, sometimes it seems like it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit what's going on in my life and, and, and the call to be thankful, the call to remember to be thankful. Again, I don't know your specific circumstances, and you don't know all of mine, but together, as we, as we look at life around us, no matter what our circumstances are, God reminds us that we can be thankful. He calls us to that. We're in the book of Revelation. I want to look at Thanksgiving from a Revelation context this morning. I want us to, I want us to look at what we've seen so far and just be reminded, be encouraged, because from what we've already seen, we have many reasons simply to, to give thanks and to be thankful this morning. Let's look at those this morning and ask God to help us and to encourage us and to, and to give us perspective that we may need so sorely this morning and from our hearts and ask God just to bring his joy and his encouragement into our life. We start with verse 1. So take your Bibles and uh, let's go through these together here in Revelation. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants and the things that must soon take place. He's showing us what's going to take place. Jesus Christ is it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first reason that we have simply to give thanks from the book of Revelation is this. The Lord has our future in his hands. All the book of Revelation is about revealing the future, revealing what's going to take place. He knows, he's in control, he's in charge, and he's revealing. He knows our future, and we can give, we can give thanks because even though we don't know what our future holds, the day to day, we know what our future holds ultimately. And we're trusting the one who has our future in his hands. And so it's perspective. We need to take our circumstances and, and lay those before the promises of God here and realize he has a future for you and for I. This is a part of that. But there are promises coming that will be fulfilled that will be glorious and, and encouraging. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. The, the reality is we don't have to worry about uh, tomorrow. We don't have to worry about what's coming because it's in God's hands. Scripture tells us not to worry about tomorrow. There's enough worries to worry about today, not tomorrow. And so we deal with one day at a time. We trust the future with the Lord. The things that we can control, which is tomorrow, we leave it in the Lord's hands. Um, we have confidence in the Lord. That's what the scriptures remind us. That's what they show us here. There's a certainty as we look at God's word. Proverbs chapter 3, 23 reminds us, surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Romans 8, 18 you know, as we go through suffering now and adversity and circumstances are hard, it, it doesn't even begin to pair, compare with what God has promised for the child of God. The glory, the presence of the glory of God, the reality of the glory of God, the promises of God in our life. James chapter 1 reminds us that when we're, when we're tested and we stay faithful and steadfast and remain under God, God promises to us the crown of life. He makes a promise and he's going to keep that promise. And here's, here's a really encouraging promise as well, Philippians 1.6, what God starts in your life, what he started in your life when he saved you, he's promised to complete that work. Right now with the circumstances of your life, God is still completing his work in your life and mine. He's still doing his work. He's accomplishing his work. He has a future that's unfolding, but he is, he is fulfilling promise. And so we need to be reminded of that. As we go to verse 3, we pick up a second promise. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. Again, we've studied all these together already. We're being reminded. Being reminded that God, we can be thankful that God has indeed given us, He's shown to us the path of blessing. Reading or hearing His Word, um, opening His Word, our hearts to His Word, uh, hearing it from our heart, uh, keeping it in obedience, pouring it into our life, applying it into our life. You know, we're not left to wander. 
We may not know uh, when things are going to change. We may not know how they're going to change. But we don't have to wander aimlessly as a Christian. We don't have to wander from day to day. We can know with certainty that Jesus Christ is working on our behalf. He's laid a path for us from which he has promised to bless us. And so, and so we come into his word and we identify that past and we stay committed. It comes from his word. We read it and we believe in faith and as we hear and then we put it into our life and we trust God. And so we learn, we can know, we can understand what things are pleasing to the Lord. Even right now, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter, no matter what mine are, the word of God teaches us what we can know so that we can please the Lord today in the midst of those circumstances. There's two realities here we see. Jeremiah chapter 17. One is the curse that's on man when we simply trust our own strength. We try to do it our own way. Uh, we turn away from the Lord. Uh, we don't trust Him. He's not a part of the solution. He's not a part of our strength. There is a separation uh, that happens, a wall that happens between us and God, a curse that takes place. The reality is in verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. The path of blessing is simply to say, Lord, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't even like what's going on. I don't like the circumstances that I'm in. I don't like the situation that I find myself in. I don't like the challenges. But here's the thing, Lord. Lord, I trust you. I trust you fully. I don't understand, but I trust you. And that's, that's the path of blessing. And God is calling you and calling us this morning, calling me to trust him. We don't have all the answers. We come to him for wisdom because we don't have all the answers. We come to him for strength because we're weak. We trust him. In verse 4, John gives us a third reason to give thanks this season. Grace to you and peace. Now, what follows is the affirmation of this. What follows is the, is the foundation for these words. I'm giving grace to you. I'm giving peace to you. And, and let me affirm that. Let me show why that's true. God has promised to you and to I this morning grace and truth. And grace is just this. It's, God, it's God's provision into my life so that I can accomplish, I can do His will. The very first element of God's will is that we come to Him in faith. That's salvation. And from that point forward, we are, we are simply doing the will of God. That's grace enabling us to do what we can't do in, in the flesh. We can't do it on our own. We do it in the, in the power of the Spirit of God in faith and from the Word of God and its truth in Jesus Christ. Peace is this. Peace comes from the, from the confidence that comes from the strength of your relationship with Christ. Peace is found in relationship. Peace is a result of relationship. I am at peace with God. I have the peace of God. Those things are true because I am, you can be, in relationship with Jesus Christ. Our circumstances may not be what we've chosen, but we can still be in relationship. We can still trust the Lord. We can still love Him and, and yearn for His heart. We can still yield to Him and, and be a weak before Him. We can still be um, dependent upon Him in every way. Peace comes when we are in this relationship and we are growing. Grace gives us the ability to, to be in that relationship and to, and to grow it and to thrive in that. We pick it up here in verse 4. Grace and peace to you, but he, he continues. And he says, From him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits, and we talked about that when we, when we preached here. This is the Spirit of God, we believe. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, from the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all, inst they're all involved here. In verse 8, I believe this is God the Father. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He is almighty. We can give thanks today because God's in control. He's in control. He's in control of our country. We've just had an election recently. He's in control of the pandemic. He's in control of all politicians and nations. He's in control of your life and mine. He is allowing things into our life that we don't always comprehend. God is in control. He is almighty. The beautiful thing is, is from the Garden of, of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane to the, to the eternal garden that we see in Revelation 22, God has always promised, He's always met man's greatest need. From the beginning to the end, God is meeting our greatest need through Christ. That's what He's promised to do this morning. He's in control. He's in charge. He will meet your need. He is sufficient. He is able. 
want you to be encouraged today. God is here to meet your need. God is here to encourage you. God is here to give you grace and peace. He's able to do that. He is sufficient. His work can't be undone. It can't be undermined. There's nothing that can undermine that. We come to Him in faith and He does His work. That's confidence. He is sovereign in every way. Isaiah 1.14 reminds us, The Lord of hosts has sworn, As I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. God's plan, God's purpose. We pick it up in verse 13. We see the now, when now we see the glimpse, John gives us a glimpse of Jesus Christ. Exalted, glorified, magnified. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. And then we have this full description of Jesus Christ. Descriptions and terms that are going to be used in the seven churches that we are now studying. And we see here that we give thanks because Jesus Christ, who is glorified, He is with us. He is walking with us. And He says He says in verse 17, in the middle of that ver verse, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Verse chapter 2, verse 2, verse 1. The words of Him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and he walks among the seven golden lampstands. He's there, he's with us, he's glorified, he's exalted. Yet where is he in this scene? He's right with you. He's right with me. He's in the midst of these churches. He's in the midst of his church. His presence, his promised presence is with his church. That's us, even today, even right now. He's there. Jesus left glory. He left. He became a servant, a suffering servant. Sacrificially, he gave his life. He was glorified. He was lifted up. And now where, now where is he? He's standing among his church, in the middle of his church, being strength to the church, being encouragement to the church, his very presence. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20. All authority is now his. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says this right now no matter where you're at. He says, I'm with you, with you right now. Just as he was with the churches there, he's with his church today, and he's with you right now. That's individual, that's personal, that's corporate, that's his church, that's me, that's you, that's his promise. That's the perspective we get. We see the glorified Savior in these verses. Beyond comprehension, beyond words. Then there he is in the middle of his churches. And what is he doing in chapter 2 and 3? He's ministering to his church. He's ministering to us. Now in chapter 2, we pick it up. Verse 2. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance. Verse 3. I know you are enduring patiently and you are bearing up for my name's sake. Another reason we can give thanks here at Thanksgiving, regardless of what's happening, regardless of the circumstances, is, is just this. The Lord has given us, through our circumstances, an opportunity to glorify, to honor His name. See, what He says here to this church, to His church, specifically here to the church in, in uh, Ephesus, He says, um, you're going through suffering. It's a part of my plan for you. It's a part of my, my plan for you. And God is right there in the midst. Hardship, adversity, challenges, it takes, on, it takes on a different perspective for the believer. No matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's happened in our nation, no matter what's happening in our community, no, no matter what's happening in, in my personal life and yours, we can trust the Lord. We can trust the Lord. The adversity, the challenges, the circumstances, you know what, you know what happens? They become opportunity for us to glorify God. They become opportunity for us to display the character of Jesus Christ in our life. That's what happens. It becomes an opportunity for the strength of the Lord to be to, to, to pour f into our life and from our life as a witness, as testimony. One thing that Revelation is all about and reminds us is that identity in Jesus Christ and hardship, it results in and equals opportunity in our life. Always for the child of God, He's promised we're going to be challenged. We're going to go through trials, tribulation. It is opportunity for us. Right now, we are facing challenge, trial, tribulation, isolation, aloneness, uh, physical 
battles against COVID or whatever it might be, and there are opportunities for us. Every challenge that you face, every challenge I face is opportunity. I have to be reminded of that regularly. One verse, Acts 1.8, God promises that we will receive power when we need it. It is the Holy Spirit. And he says this, when that power comes into our life and it's there every day, then we will be witnesses for Jesus Christ. That word, again, witness is martus. It means martyrs. It means that being a Christian isn't easy. God says, you're going to have opportunities to be witnesses. You're going to have opportunities to, uh, to display the very power of God in your life. The way you're going to do that is, is by handling the circumstances of your life in a way that honors me. You're going to have strength and grace that is divine in your life to help you be strong, to help you be encouraged, to help you, yes, even to experience joy in the midst. Chapter 2, as we pick it up in, in verse 9. I know, I know your tribulation. In verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. At the end of that verse, that you may be tested, you will have tribulation. Now, we've talked about that here already, but I want us to see what's important here. He says in this verse, you may be tested, you will have tribulation. I know your tribulation. We can give thanks to the Lord because, because as we face this adversity, here's the confidence. God is orchestrating everything. He's orchestrating our circumstances. He's orchestrating the the. the the adversity, the tribulation, the challenge that we're facing right now. He's doing it, remember, because He is good. He is always good. He's doing that in our life. He is, he is laying challenges before you and I so that He can reveal Himself in your life and mine as good, so He can give us opportunity to display Jesus Christ in our life. As a result, we can thank the Lord. We can thank the Lord for things we don't know. We don't know his purpose all the time. We don't know his timetable all the time. We don't know we don't know his plan for us. We know it we know the big picture. We understand the path of blessing for us, but we don't always understand what's happening, why it's happening, how long it's gonna last, what impact it's gonna have. We don't always understand those things. We usually don't, frankly. We can't. But we know that God's gonna provide. He's gonna provide everything that we need for our life and for Godliness. Second Peter one three. That's his promise to you and I. I want, you to, I want you to be encouraged this morning and be able to give thanks this morning to God for that reality. Now, I want, I want to give to you, I want to make a quick but important distinction. God brings trials into our life. He brings circumstances into our life. He brings challenges and hardship and adversity. He does it. He, he's orchestrating. He's creating something beautiful as an orchestra does, a tapestry in our life. But temptation, temptation is not not of God. It doesn't come from God. James chapter 1 verse 13 reminds us when we are tempted, we can never say I'm being tempted by God. God, God doesn't tempt anyone and he himself cannot be tempted. Temptation never comes from God. Here's the reality of temptation. In fact, here's God's promise to us in chapter 10 verse 13, 1 Corinthians. No temptation. We face it. It's common to us. We we're, every day. It's a battlefield. But God has promised to always provide a way of escape, always, in our life. He's provided a way of escape that we can endure it. Not only endure it, but that we can be overcomers. That we can be successful for the sake of Jesus Christ. That we can be successful in in such a way that the joy of the Lord is experienced in our life. That we give Him thanks and praise for giving us that victory. And when it comes to trials and trusting and testing in our life, then I want us to just kind of keep this in mind as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. He t uh, Paul refers to the suffering they had there in Asia. He says, we, our burden was so strong, we were burdened beyond our ability to handle it. Our strength, we couldn't do it ourselves. We despaired, we literally despaired of our life. And sometimes, right now, we're just facing circumstances where it, it truly, honestly brings despair into our life. It brings maybe discouragement into our life. It, it seems like it's more than we can handle. But here's, here's the beautiful piece. This is where the tapestry comes together. It's this. But all of this is to make us fully rely on God. Not on ourselves, but on God. That's the key. Paul says he delivered us. He will deliver us and he will deliver us again. What is frog? It means to fully rely on God. There's a gentleman that many of us know, Harold Green, PG we called him. He was a vice president at Cedarville for many years. 
And he, would, he spoke on this very topic and he gave out little frogs and they were reminders to him. I still have mine. And it's a reminder to us that we are to fully rely on God all of the time. From the Word of God itself, from this passage right here, is that truth. Front and center in our lives. We can, we can trust Him. He brings circumstances in our, in our lives so that we would trust Him. That we would fully rely on Him. We can give thanks that He's able. We can give thanks that He's there. We can give thanks that He gives us opportunity to, to magnify His name through the challenges of life. That we can just do in, in just small part, just in a l- little way, we can do what He did in His life for us by going to the cross, by overcoming sin and death. Chapter 2, verse 10. As we continue, John writes these words, Be faithful, be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life, and I will give you the crown of life. Here's why we can be thankful this morning. Another reason, another reminder to us here at Thanksgiving, no matter what we can or can't do this Thanksgiving, there are still reasons to be thanks, to give thanks. God calls us. He gives us an opportunity to be faithful like He is. I want to be faithful for the Lord. Don't you? He was faithful to His Father on our behalf. He was faithful to you and I. He carried out and fulfilled and is fulfilling His promises to us. He is faithful. I am, I am thankful for the opportunity to be faithful in my life to the Lord. Faithfulness is tested when we're going through circumstances and adversity. And so we give thanks that God gives us those opportunities. We give thanks that He gives us the ability, the strength to, to do that. We trust Him for that. The reminder is this. We are, indeed we can be, we can be faithful to the very end. That's God's promise to us. We can be faithful in, in conduct. We can be faithful in our character. We can be faithful in our service. Faithful to Him, trusting Him to do what? Build His church. Um, to, to reach people for Jesus Christ, to bring glory to God. He wants us to be faithful. This is God's call to every believer, really all of us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 reminds us we've been crucified with Christ. We don't live for ourselves. We live for Him. We're to be faithful to that end. That's the key. We're to be faithful to Him. We do it by faith. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. We are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. That's being faithful. Being faithful says, every day I will bring the, the spiritual battleground, the spiritual battle that I face that's in my heart and in my life and in my circumstances, I will bring that to the Lord and I will faithfully trust Him. I will be faithful in obedience. I will be faithful in giving my emotional, my spiritual, my mental challenges to the Lord and I will be faithful to Him. I want to encourage you to that end. This is indeed one of the rarest qualities that we can find. What is that rare, rare quality? It's faithfulness. Proverbs 26 There are so many of us who proclaim to love God, to love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, as it were. And yet here's the the reality. But a faithful man who can find, a faithful woman who can find. It's really a challenge to find those who are truly faithful to the Lord. Every day I have to work at being faithful. I have to work at being faithful. It's never easy. And it's not easy for you. And so we, we come to the Lord in prayer. We depend on Him. We say, Lord, I need your help. We ask Him to be the strength. We ask Him to be the strength. In relationship, we receive and find that strength. God has enabled this. He's, he's promised this. He's an example to us of faithfulness. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 He who calls you to salvation, to, to life, is faithful. He will surely do it. He will accomplish His will. He will accomplish His purpose. When God calls you and He called you at salvation... He is faithful to you. He will be faithful to you to help you, to help me be faithful to Him. Doesn't that encourage you? It's not your fight. It's not your challenge. It's not your path alone. He walks it with you. He he holds you up. He gives you strength. It is His fight. It is His battleground. It is His strength in us. It's not ours. We can't do it ourselves. And so we yield. So we depend, and so we surrender, and so we, and we, we beg of the Lord to give us every day His grace, and He does. And, and He pours out lovingly all that we need for life and godliness. Chapter 2, verse 12, as we continue. 
He writes to the church in Pergamum, and he says, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Another reason that we can give thanks is this, is that he's given us his word. He's given us his word to touch our life. The Lord touches our life with the word of God. It is the sharp two-edged sword that is here. The goal of his touch is this. It's, we're going to see this as we come to chapter 3. Remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. The goal, the goal of his word in our life is, is that we would keep his word, that we would love him fully, that the power of God's word would, would resonate and pour into our life. And it would be applied to our life by faith. And we would, when we, when we get off of that track and get off of that trail, that by, we would repent and, and be drawn right back into that loving, faithful walk with the Lord. You know, the Word of God in our life, we come to love His Word. We come uh, to His Word that it might fill our life. We come to grow from His Word. We come to conform to His Word. We come to His Word so we might learn obedience. We come to His Word so that the power of God might be revealed in, in our life, in your life and mine. We come to His Word so that we would share His truth from our life to others who need the Gospel. The Word of God is, is life-changing. Um, just some reminders as we see this, John 5.24, the Word of God gives life by faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter, Psalm 119, the Word of God is beautiful, it's wonderful. When we come to it, may we, may we see it as something that is precious to us, it is a treasure, it is wonderful to read and wonderful to learn. We see here in John 17, God sets us apart. He marks our life by His Word. It is truth in our life. If you trust it and apply it by faith, you, you and I, we will always find it to be true in our life. We see this in James 1.21. We're to receive the Word of God with humility. It's been poured into our life. It's been implanted. And, and uh, its DNA has been uh, intertwined with our DNA as, as children of God. And so with humility, we receive its power. We receive its strength, its transformation. That's what takes place. Colossians reminds us that the Word of God is to dwell in my life richly. I'm to treasure its application in my life and the relationship that it brings uh, into my life with Jesus Christ. It brings thankfulness, ultimately, a thanksgiving season. Luke 28, 11, 28, reminds us that we're to keep as God's Word. We're to hear it, we're to keep it. Romans 15, God's Word gives us encouragement. It shows us the encouragement we have in Christ. Colossians 4 reminds us that the Word of God is power. We pray that it would be powerfully uh, a part of our, our verbal witness before others, that they would see Jesus Christ. Our last reason is to give thanks from, from Revelation. There are many I'm sure we could have shared, but let me finish with this one here. In, in verse 7, uh, 17, right? Uh, look at chapter 2, verse, verse 7, very last. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Look at uh, verse 11. To the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Look at, look at uh, uh, verse 17. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone. And um, these are promises from God. We can be thankful ultimately here at the end of the day, no matter what our circumstances are, because God gives us hope and God gives us a promise. The promise is this, that we would be overcomers. That word is used with every church here. He reminds us, John 17, in the world you're going to have tribulation. The circumstances are going to be a challenge in your life, but I've overcome the world. You can trust me. 1 John 5, 4, it is by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we overcome. That's the victory for every day over our, our mental, our emotional, our spiritual, our physical challenges. Our faith in Jesus Christ becomes victory in our life. Romans 8, 37, we're conquerors because we know He loved us. We know, we're conquerors because we know He's always working good in our life. We're conquerors because we trust Him. And so we know that any hardship that we face, any circumstances that, that are adversity in our life, we know this, that it's going to be worth it all. So God, help us to be faithful. God, help us to trust Him and to be a witness for Him in all these things. God, help me to serve You. It's It'll never be fruitless. It'll never be... It'll never be futile. It's, it's worth it all. 
God's going to honor you. God will honor you. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Trust Him. He will honor you for your faithfulness. One day your reward before the Lord will be great. Keep, keep trusting Him faithfully. Keep thanking Him for things that maybe you can't understand. Keep thanking Him for what you do understand. That He is in charge and He's on the throne and He loves you this morning. And He's promised to give you what you need. And as we close, here's really the greatest reason for Thanksgiving. Think about this. It's how we close this book. It's how, it's how John wraps this book up. The greatest reason is this, is that it's, it's going to happen. Jesus Christ is coming again. I am coming soon. That's promise, folks. That is promise. And so, and so we just say together what? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I trust here at Thanksgiving that, uh, that the Word of God will just encourage you and that you'll be able to give thanks. Trust that these things are, are happening in your life. I trust that God would just give you faith and, and strengthen your faith. Like Peter said, Lord, in, Lord, increase my faith. I don't see how all these things could, could be good in my life. I don't understand the circumstances. Lord, I sure wish they could change. I don't know how much more I can handle. And then we take the perspective that's there and that's real, and we lay that before the Lord, and we begin to remind our hearts of the faithfulness of God. We begin to remind ourselves who Jesus Christ is and what He's doing for us what He's promised to us. We remind ourselves that it's worth it all. And you know what? If we just worship the Lord, if we stand in a relationship before Him, I can guarantee this, you will be encouraged. And you will come away with reasons to give thanks to the Lord. And so, and so come before Him this morning and love Him. And come, be, come before Him this morning and just say, Lord, I need you. Because you know what? When we say that to Him, He loves those words. They are a treasure to His heart. And He is there to respond and to meet your need. I pray this morning that, that your worship and your time with the Lord and your encouragement from His Word will just bring you to this place. That thanksgiving truly is able to again come from your heart and you can share that with others as witness and testimony. May God just use what's, what He's shown us this morning to just simply minister to the need of your heart, to speak into your life, to extend grace and ultimately peace into your life this morning. Lord, this is all divine. It is your ability in us. You give us the power to, to follow this path and to stay true to it, to stay true to you. Help us by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, and we will meet with you again next week.